I was offered for a ridiculous amount of money. Okay, and this is approaching $20 million a year, and it would be a, a multi-year deal. By your mid-30s, you're the, the face of uh, the network sports division. Why do you think you were able to kind of work your way up the ladder so quickly? This is the honest truth, Graham. I never angled for or politicked for any job or any assignment at any time. And when the networks took note of me, it was as a play-by-play -play guy. And then when Brian Gumbel went from hosting NBC Sports to the Today Show, um, the people at NBC Sports had seen something in me. They said, you can do this. And I said, I've never done any studio stuff at all. In fact, for the first five years of it, I never used a teleprompter. I ad-libbed everything. I had little notes on a card. I guess that what appealed, and Mike Tirico has, in his own way, has this quality too. I could do play-by-play. -play, I could host. And then it turned out, although I had to be convinced by Dick Ebersol and Brandon Tartikoff, it turned out that I was able to do stuff outside sports. Uh, so I did the later and, program. And Letterman first put that idea in Ebersol's head, right? Yeah, Letterman um, said to Dick Ebersol, and the exact quote was, if he can make Bart Starr interesting for an hour, why couldn't he talk to anybody? And that too was important to me, not so much as a career stepping stone, but it was something that I learned that I could do. And it was gratifying, not just at the time, but now it has a new life on YouTube. And I hear from people pretty often who say, gee, I saw you with Dennis Hopper. I saw your interview with Paul McCartney or whatever it might be. And it's very gratifying that people appreciate it 30 years later. Did you ever feel like there were those that outworked you? I think I actually got to a point where I learned what I didn't need to know. And that's really important with the Olympics. First few Olympics I did, I'm literally trying to memorize, you know, every, every pole vaulter from Peru. And then eventually it became clear to me that the host of the Olympics needs to be a very good generalist, needs to know the big storylines, needs to know the history of the Olympics, the history of the host city and nation, and also be able to take a briefing if something unexpected happens, get the material from the researchers, and make some kind of narrative out of it. A good broadcasting career, a good presentation, should be like a really good edition of the old Sports Illustrated. It has some elements of journalism. It has some elements of commentary. It has some humor. It has some history. It has an appreciation of the beauty, excitement, drama, and shared experience of sports. Maybe not in exactly the same proportion every time out, but over time, that's the texture. If it's only one or two notes, if it's only a celebration, but no skeptical eye toward the issues of the elephants in the room, then something's missing. But if it doesn't have some celebration, some embrace of the drama, then what the hell are we here for? And I think that at my best, you know, it's a different stage of my career now, but at my best, I think I hit all those notes on the scale. What impact, if any, do you think your pursuit of excellence in your profession has had on your personal life? I think 90% of it has been good. Um, the experiences that I've had, and more importantly, the experiences I've been able to give my family and friends, um, that's, that's enhanced my life. Um, it's brought me into contact with interesting people. Um, it's informed my view of the world. It's taken me literally, geographically, almost every place that I've ever wanted to go. And in terms of the people I've known or the preparation I've had to do especially for stuff outside sports. It's broadened me as a person. Uh, there's always sacrifices in, especially when my kids were younger, you know, you're away because you have to do the games, but that's one of the great things about having this profession. A kid can be there and understand it. In 1993, when David Letterman went from NBC to CBS, he controlled the hour after. And I had followed him on NBC, and I'd been on his show many times, apart from my own show. And he offered me that hour after him, and to sweeten the pot, CBS offered a spot on 60 Minutes, which is still the gold standard, but then it had even greater effect on the, on the culture. So 60 Minutes and the spot after David Letterman. And they said, we'll charter you, you know, from St. Louis 
Uh, you can do two shows on Thursday. You'll be home on Thursday night. You don't have to come back till late Monday afternoon. They had the whole thing laid out. It was a, a very tempting offer, but this was a big part of my decision. You can't say to a kid, I'm interviewing the Secretary of State. Want to come along? But you sure as hell can say, let's go to the World Series. Let's go to the NBA Finals. We'll see Michael Jordan. Let's go to the Olympics. They can relate to what you're doing and actually be part of what you're doing. Okay, I'll give you one more because you have uh, turned down a number of significant uh, offers. Yeah. 2007, Don Imus is canceled from his national radio show Not many people and, know this. and MSNBC. Mm -hmm. We had the radio rights at Premier Radio Networks when I was their vice president of programming in 2005, six. Um, and when Imus made the mistake that he made on the air and they let him go at WFAN in New York, you know, that show was on MSNBC it had been syndicated in a number of markets. We, we didn't own WFA and it was owned by CBS, but um, as a partnership, I thought it was a, an interesting opportunity to bring Bob to Morning Drive Radio and put him across the country. I could control the syndication rights. And within a few days, and I didn't ask him to do this, he patched together some offer and I was offered for a ridiculous amount of money. Okay, and this is approaching $20 million a year, and it would be a, a multi-year deal. So it, it would have been one of the biggest deals in radio. I mean, you know, Stern and Rush Limbaugh had the biggest deals, but Bob would have had one of the biggest deals uh, uh, matched in, in their ballpark at that time. So really, it came down to Bob's personal decision. When you think about it, it was just a decision to not do it. First of all, uh, the 2008 Olympics were pending. Um, I owed that to Dick Ebersol and the people at NBC. Plus, I didn't want to get up at 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning, five days a week. By Thursday of the first week, I would have regretted it. Plus, so too would NBC. I would have been a very bad choice uh, for what they were offering me. They, they were wrong-headed in that. And I, I, I never thought about it for two seconds after politely declining. HBO, uh, as I understand it, originally wanted you as the, the host of uh, Real Sports, and, and NBC, I, I don't think at the time, would uh, yeah. you know, let you do it. On the NBC side, when uh, Bryant Gumbel was the then Today Show anchor, and they were concerned that uh, he might not you know, continue with his contract, mm -hmm. they approached you. Yes, um, they did approach me about the Today Show, almost the same reaction. I'm not getting up at four o'clock in the morning. I mean, what's your next offer? You want me to walk on hot coals? I'm not getting up at four o'clock in the morning. It's not who I am. Just like the earlier uh, offer you alluded to, I wouldn't have been the right choice. Even if I wanted to do it, I wouldn't have been the right choice. 